Hello everyone, my name is Bedram and I'm a professor in data analytics. Welcome to another episode of Deep Learning. All right, after our relatively long but very exciting journey in deep computer vision, let's talk about our module number six, deep sequence modeling. In this module, we're going to specifically cover classical models like recurrent neural networks and LSTM, and we also talk about natural language processing, the NLP. We're going to have three theory lecture videos for this module. You know, parts one, I will talk about deep sequence modeling, and then, as always, we're going to start with the basics. So we're going to start with the very basic, simple recurrent neural network. And then in part two, we explain why we should go beyond these uh, RNN, what, what are the limitations. We talk about gated cells and specifically LSTM architecture. And finally, in part three, we're going to apply deep sequence modeling to text data. And you're going to investigate natural language processing models. Let's begin by different kinds of sequence data. You know, after all, we need to know what is a sequence data and then how we can model them. So sequence data refers to any data that has a specific order or sequence to it, right? And for example, we can start with the very basic one, which is time series. So this is the most obvious one. Time series data is, is an example of sequence data. Time series data is a sequence of data measured at regular intervals. So maybe this is a key term, regular intervals, because we have data set that are reg irregular intervals, but we're talking about the ones that the intervals uh, come the irregularly. So these are time series data. And examples are abundant there, like stock prices, weather patterns, medical records, and you name it. So here's, for example, Google stock price from 2015 to 2022, I guess, right? The next one is text data. So text data is sequence of data that is composed of words, sentences, and paragraphs. Like, you know, the examples are tweets, news articles, product reviews, and etc. So text data is commonly used in natural language processing applications, such as sentiment analysis. You know, you're reviewing a movie and you want to say if the sentiment is positive or negative, right? Uh, text classification and any kind of language translation. The next one is audio data. So audio data is a sequence of data that is recorded and or generated as sound waves, right? So the examples are speech recognition, uh, speech recording, sorry, and music tracks and etc. So this kind of data set is commonly used in speech recognition, in music analysis, and, and many other fields. And finally, the last one is actually the image data and video data. I just combine them and call them video data. Basically, it's a sequence of data that is represented as a sequence of images or frames. A single image itself can be considered a sequence data as well, depending on what task we are, we are doing. But in general, you know, images, videos are in this category. So again, the examples are all around us, you know, like movie clips, surveillance footage. This data set is commonly used in video analysis applications, such as, you know, action recognition or video surveillance or video summar summarization. So these are the kinds of um, sequence data that we are going to talk about. And uh, But for starters, we need to understand how we can handle the very basic one, which is the time series. And this is, a, uh, this is the goal of this uh, part of the video. OK, so we know that time series is a kind of uh, sequence data. Now let's see what are different tasks we can do with time series, right? So the, the, the first one, of course, the most obvious one is predicting, right? You want to forecast something. You want to predict what happens next. And I think more than 90% of the time when we're dealing with a time series, you end up forecasting stuff, right? So for example, uh, you want to predict electricity consumption in a specific period of time. You want to predict uh, temperature forecast or stock price prediction and things like that. The second task is classification, time series classification. The goal is to assign one or more labels to a time series. So for example, if you want to classify you know, if a website visitors are human or bots, right? Based on their activity. So you are you know, monitoring uh, website visitors activity. So you're collecting some features over time and you want to identify, you want to classify them as, you know, for example, human or bots. So the, the next one is event detection. This is, um, I think, the, the most uh, maybe com um, um, commonly used one is hot word detection, right? Uh, so, for example, all of us are familiar with OK Google or Hey Siri, and the idea is that we want to we want to monitor within a continuous data stream. We wanted to see if one of these 
expected event has happened or not, right? And the key term here is expected event, right? We know that, so for example, we know we are, we are waiting for OK Google, we are waiting for Hey Siri, and we're monitoring uh, this within a continuous data stream, and we want to flag it if, it if that happened or not. So this is the event detection. Um, the last one, which is quite um, uh, similar to event detection, but with a very uh, with a simple difference, is anomaly detection. So anomaly detection, we are going to uh, detect anything unusual happening within a continuous data stream. So remember, in event detection, we were expecting that thing. In anomaly detection, this thing is unusual, right? So example is, for example, unusual activity on a network or you have unusual volatility spikes in Bitcoin price, things like that. So the, the, the point is that both for event detection and anomaly detection, we are waiting to trigger something, but in event detection, that something is expected. In anomaly detection, that something is unusual. All right. Let's start with a very simple time series forecasting task. So here's the example. We want to predict the temperature 24 hours in the future. So for example, right now it's 9 a.m. I want to see what is the weather temperature 9 a.m. tomorrow in, in 24 hours. And so the target variable is going to be the temperature. And we have in this data set, we have, by the way, this is a very classical data set. And um, we are going to have 14 different variables as features, including pressure, humidity, wind direction, and etc. So this is our target. This is, these are the features. And the data has been recorded every 10 minutes from 2009 to 2016. So here, if we zoom out and we look at the entire data, for this seven years, uh, kind of, uh, every 10 minutes, we have 400,000 plus observations. So at a very high level, we see this seasonality and things like that. The data is obviously stationary, well, really, at least visually. We can check all these things out. And if we zoom in a little bit, for example, look at the past 10 days, and uh, the past 10 days, 24 hours, and we're collecting every 10 minutes. So we're gonna end up with 1,440 observations, right? So this task seems to, the, we're gonna see that it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy job to forecast temperature in the next 24 hours. But uh, let's see what are the approaches, what can we do? The first thing we can use is just using classical econometric models. And surprisingly, they are still power, they're, they're very powerful models, especially if the data set is stationary, you know, is well behaved, like, you know, like temperature, electricity demand, things like that. So we can use classical econometric models like Sarima, for example, for this one, Sarima model or Sarima X model is going to be a good fit. So that's, that's one option. Another one is just use machine learning models, right? Machine learning models and maybe the boosting algorithms uh, like XGBoost, CatBoost, LightGBM, you name it. Uh, but you should be careful when you're doing machine learning, in general, machine learning and deep learning. When you want to apply these models to time series, it comes with some challenges. We spent one full lecture on talking about the challenges of time series in machine learning application. So all those challenges are still relevant for the deep learning. Uh, namely, if the data set is stationary or not, if you see seasonality, and most importantly, the data dependency, time dependency is a big deal. We, not, we cannot simply shuffle the data, we have to preserve those orderings. So these are all challenges that we have to keep in mind when we're doing deep learning. And finally, the third approach can be deep learning model, and this is what we're going to cover. But in the next couple of slides, I want to start with the very basic benchmark. And then we're going to extend from that, right? We're going to say, okay, let's let's look at the benchmark, which is what happened yesterday. So this is naive forecaster. The naive forecaster is simply you know, like random walk, right? Random walk without drift, let's say. What happened yesterday is going to happen tomorrow, right? So we're going to look at the performance of that naive forecaster. And surprisingly, you're going to see that in some applications, it's even hard to output that night forecaster. Then we're going to start working with a simple neural network, right? We're going to flatten the data and then pass it to a neural network, deep neural network, and see how it performs. Then we're going to talk about why we should go beyond that, right? So I think it is obvious that if I flatten the data here, it's going to just destroy all the ordering in the data. So we have to do something better. We can use CNN, you know, convolutional neural networks, 
because it does have spatial ordering. So we can maybe apply ConvNets and see how it works. And then finally, we are going to come up with a better architecture, which is namely RNN. So that's that's the roadmap for the for the rest of the slide. All right. First things first, let's prepare the data. We are going. So here's a setup. We will say that given the previous five days, so namely 120 hours, can we predict the temperature in 24 hours? And of course, this 24 hours is going to be after the end of the sequence. And we're going to collect uh, one sample per hour. So we know that this, the data has been collected every 10 minutes. So we have six observations in one hour. We're going to pick one of those observations. All right. And obviously, in deep learning, uh, we should be quite familiar with this uh, by now, we are going to work with batches of data, right? So our sequence length is going to be five days, 120 hours. And these are a bunch of those batches, right? So for example, we can go from uh, data time step one to 120, and then 24 hours after that, this is going to be our target. So this is train, and then you want to make a prediction 24 hours later. Let's say the next batch is something like this. We start from hour number two, we go to 121, and then we want to make a prediction for 145. Again, here's another batch starting from three to 122, and you want to make a prediction for 146. So these are basically the batches of data, and we can have a bunch of them, and we can stack it together, right? So we're going to say, for this specific example, the batch size is 256, meaning that we're going to have 256 of these samples and uh, remember of these sequences and we're going to sample them randomly shuffle them and then batch them so uh, just pay attention the shuffling thing is between sequences right within each sequence so for example if i want to look at one sequence or let me use the right pen if i want to look at one sequence uh, like this I'm, I'm not allowed to shuffle the data right because this is time series we can shuffle between samples between sequences, but within a sequence, we don't shuffle the data, right? Now, I think the important thing is that you should remember what is the size of this uh, data, right? Especially for sample shape and target shape. So uh, as you remember, we're going to save these things as a tensor. So our sample shape is going to be a tensor rank, uh, uh, rank three. And if you remember from our previous lecture, we said that a time series is a tensor rank three with the shape of the shape of a time series is like this. We start with samples, and then we have time steps, time steps, and then we have features. Okay. So in this example, our samples are you now we are using a batch size 256. So we have 256 of those sequences. Time step is 120. Each of those sequences is, has length 120, and features are 14 features. Okay, so this is our sample shape. The target shape is a tensor rank one, and basically it's a vector. So obviously we have 256 of these red observations. Okay, all right. So that was the setup. Okay, so we need a benchmark. We have to see in time series uh, what do we call common sense baseline, right? For example, for in classification, if I have a binary class classification problem and one class there is 97%, the other class there is 30%, so the accuracy of that classification is 97%. So if your model is doing a 96%, you should not get excited because if you have done nothing and say, my, you know, let's, let's build a model that always predict class one, which is 97%, and then your accuracy is going to be 97%. The same story here in time series, one of the powerful forecasters you know, with, that we commonly use as a common sense baseline or the benchmark is our naive forecaster. So the naive forecaster is, is pretty straightforward. We say temperature 24 hours from now is equal to temperature right now. So for example, it is again, 9 a.m. Temperature right now is 30 Celsius degrees. It means that I'm going to use it as my prediction for the temperature tomorrow at 9 a.m. It's going to be 30 degrees Celsius. That's it. So this is basically, if you're familiar with time series concepts, this is basically a random walk with no drift forecaster, right? And you will see that uh, in practice, sometimes it's really hard you know, to output this simple naive forecaster baseline, especially when it comes to stock price prediction. So for this data set, the performance on the validation sets, uh, and we're, we're reporting the MAE, mean absolute error. 
uh, is going to be 2.44 degrees Celsius. Of course, the unit of this is the same as the unit of the target variable because we're talking about mean absolute errors. Uh, in the test set, the test MAE is 2.62 degrees. So this means that on average, our model is kind of off by 2.5 degrees, again, on average. Uh, this is not bad, right? You know, if you look at this you know, entire data set and on average, you're 2.5 degrees off, it's not bad. So this means that, again, it should be a signal that it's hard. It's, it's kind of hard to output this naive forecaster. And it is generally true. This statement is generally true for so many time series, especially in the stock market. It, it's, it's, um, it's unbelievably hard to output your random walk with no drift. All right. So now let's look into our uh, next model. Let's try DNN, so deep neural network. Uh, so this is our uh, model you know, using TensorFlow Keras. We're going to have input layers, and you know, we flatten the layers, and then use a dense layer, and then make a prediction, right? So starting with the input layer, so what do we have? It, this is an input layer from Keras. Uh, the shape is sequence length, which is we use five days, 120 hours. And this is simply our feature space dimension, 14 features we have. So this is our layer number one, input layer. Again, the shape is, these are the batch sizes, and then 120, 14, right? The next one, the next thing that we do is, which is we have to pay very good attention, we're going to flatten this input layer, right? So what does it mean? Remember, you know, we have an input shape of something like this. Let me use the right pen. We have, uh, this is 120 with 14 features, right? So if you want to pass it to a deep neural network, we have to flatten it. So if I flatten it, it means that if I go ahead and multiply this things 120 by 14, we're going to get 1680. So these are 1680 features. It goes from, you can think of it like X1 to X 1680. Okay. So right now you can see the big problem, right? When you're flattening the data, you are literally just ignoring the, uh, the time dependencies. You're, you're, you're ruining that temporal a property of time series so this this is a big alert right uh, but regardless you should know that when you're using deep neural network to a time series this is what's happening then of course we're going to add a dense layer you know with 16 nodes and an activation we're going to use your ReLU. Uh, you can you can use an, the yeah this is a this is a hidden layer activation so we are here obviously the number of parameters is going to be this 1680 which is coming from the previous layer multiply 16 nodes plus 16 if you do the math you should get this all right and then finally if we're going to add an output layer of course there's going to be one node and the activation is just linear because we are doing time series uh, we are doing reg regression okay so if we do that now we come up with this relatively small deep neural network. It only has 26,900 parameters. Again, all these things are relative, right? And then the test MAE, mean absolute error, uh, is 2.62. So this is pretty much the same as our naive forecaster, no improvement. We're not surprised here because we know that flattening a time series data is not a good idea. So let's see what other neural network architecture we can use to save those uh, let's say dependencies and uh, we're going to look into CNN next. All right, let's try CNN convolutional neural network. I will start by telling you the motivation. Why do we think that maybe CNN is a good fit for a time series data? The idea is that maybe a temporal covenant, a covenant which is aware of temporal dependencies of time can reuse the same representations across different days here in this example, right? This is much like, you know, when we talked about in computer vision, when a spatial covenant, the covenant which is aware of width and height of an image, can reuse the same representation across different locations in an image. Remember, in the deep computer vision, we had something like this. We said there's an image, let's say it's a grayscale with only one channel. And then instead of flattening the pixels, we said, let's use a filter. So this is, these are the representation we're talking about, filter of size three by three, and it slide it over the entire image and then try to extract those features and then flatten those features at the end of the day, make a prediction. For time series, the story is exactly the same. We say, instead of flattening the time series, let's use, for example, for one feature. So this is one of the features. We have a sequence of 120. Let's use a window. So in this example, we're gonna use a window of length 24. So this is our temporal component. You can think of it as a filter analogous to 
uh, analogous to computer vision uh, filter size 24 and we're going to slide it through time and then extract features and we assume that we so this is an important assumption that this same representation you know we can we can use this uh, we can reuse the same representation these numbers for this 24 window uh, the, can be used across different days right is it a good assumption well i don't know maybe for for temperature forecasting not necessarily but maybe for other time series yeah we, we can we can use cnn uh, so let's see how we can do it in uh, TensorFlow Keras. But the reason that I'm doing it here, we're going to review this thing in the Python section of the course as well. But I just want to make sure that you're aware how these things uh, are calculated, especially the number of parameters, because we didn't talk about count 1D in computer vision. Okay, so the input layer is basically pretty much the same sequence 120, length 120, and this is 14 features. And now we have, we're going to construct our first conv, uh, conv 1D layer. Remember, this is this is a temporal component compared to a spatial component. This is basically one dimension. We can use activation ReLU. I'm going to apply eight of these windows and these windows that you see here, eight of these windows. Each of those windows are going to capture different behavior of a time series, right? And each of them has a size of 24. So these are where the numbers are coming from, right? And just like CNN, uh, we, just like computer vision, we are going to do max pooling. We can stack a bunch of these uh, Conv1D layers now on max pooling. And at the end of the day, we're going to do global average max pooling and then flattening things. And basically, this is the global average pooling. And then pass it to a dense layer with one node. And then that's it. This is where we can make predictions for regression, right? So one last thing I wanted to talk about is how we can calculate these parameters, right? So maybe probably this is new. We haven't done this before. Uh, where is this number 2,696 is coming from? Remember, we have 14 features, right? 14 features. For each feature, we are doing something like this. We are dealing with a window of tw size 24, so this is 24. And so we have 24. We are going to, uh, the goal is to find these 24 weights for each feature. So we have 14 of these features, so 14 by 24. And at the end of the day, we have eight of these filters, right? So 14 features, each filter has a size of 24. I'm going to apply eight of them, and then we're going to add eight bias term for each filter so if you do the math you should get this 2696 right so just uh, don't worry if you're not following this calculation it's it's not a big deal but just be aware this is nothing different from what we did in cnn for computer vision now we are working with one dimension the convolutional layer all right now let's look at the performance Okay, look at the CNN performance. The test MAE is 3.10. Remember, our naive forecaster was 2.62. So this is 3.10 degrees Celsius. It is way worse, right? So let's see what's going on. Why this concept of CNN temporal component is not working here. Remember, this is even worse than the densely connected model. Even for when we were flattening things, you know, right up front, it was doing a better job compared to CNN. So, so what's going on here? So a couple of things. The most important one is that this translation invariance assumption that we have in convolutional uh, neural networks in CNN simply does not work here. So what is it? What is translation invariance assumption? So we have talked about this before. Translation invariance invariance assumption right so this is not working here what is that it simply means that if you slide a window or filter whatever you want to call it over the sequence the content of the window should follow the same properties independently of the location of the window does that make sense here probably not because remember based on this translation invariance assumption cnn is treating every segment of the data the same way this means that, for example, remember, we used the window of 24. We are saying that 5 a.m. to 5 a.m. is literally the same as 7 a.m. to 7 a.m., but that's not the case here. For this specific example, that's absolutely not correct. So this translation invariance assumption does not apply to this kind of time series data set, and that's why we're seeing a very worse performance. And secondly, maybe this is less important, but still important, that's why CNN is performing worse is these pooling layers that we did in the previous slide 
are kind of destroying the order information. So we are trying to keep, by, by using this window of size 24, we try to at least uh, be aware of those temporal things. But at the end of the day, we are using pooling layers. Those pooling layers are destroying this order information. And this is basically what we see for train MAE versus validation MAE. So it seems that the model, even in a train set, is not learning much, right? Even in a train set, uh, we are getting an MAE 2.8-ish uh, after 10 epochs, which is which is not good at all, at least compared to our uh, common sense benchmark. So these are these are our initial uh, solutions to this problem, right? Deep learning solutions. We started with deep neural networks. We said that flattening the data is killing the time dependencies. Then we looked into CNN. And for this specific data set, we saw that this translation invariance assumption simply does not work here. But uh, my my message to you is that uh, CNN is, is not that bad. For some specific time series, you can still apply CNN because it is computationally a lot simpler compared to recurrent neural networks. And performance-wise, is sometimes it's not that bad. So just always keep this model in your arsenal when you're doing time series prediction. But be aware that uh, maybe, yeah, maybe the winning architecture is RNN, recurrent neural network that we're going to talk about, or LSTM. But they are computationally heavy. So if you need to run something, you know, faster, give CNN a try, and maybe, maybe with changing these filter sizes and etc., you get a better performance. Okay. All right, now let's look into the RNN structure or architecture. Okay, for starters, let's see what are the requirements for a sequence modeling design, right? So to model sequence data efficiently, we need to we need to have an architecture that basically do the followings. That architecture needs to preserve the order. So this is a big deal, especially for time series, right? So for time series, we need to make sure that, you know, for example, for weather forecasting, for stock price forecasting, we cannot simply shuffle the data, right? Uh, however, for any for other types of sequence modeling like natural language processing, when it comes to text, it might be different. Sometimes we can shuffle the data because imagine there's a sentences, you know, and you're doing text classification. And uh, sometimes it really doesn't matter to, if you read the sentence from, you know, uh, just random, randomly shuffle the words. And at the very end, you can understand the sentiment of that sentences, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But just be aware that for time series tasks, preserve the order is a must. For natural language processing, we can be less uh, strict on that in that uh, matter. The next one is uh, this design should account for long-term dependencies, right? So this basically means that we may need information from far past to accurately predict the future, right? Especially in NLP, this is a big deal. So for example, you're, you're translating stuff or you want to predict what is the next word. And uh, at the beginning of the text, you said, okay, I'm from France. And then there was a big, uh, long text in between and then you said, okay, so I can speak fluently, then you have to make a prediction. If you don't know that at the very beginning of the sentence or paragraph, you, you use the term, I'm from France, then you cannot make a good prediction at the end, right? So sometimes, again, in NLP, this longer term dependencies is going to become very important. And that uh, model design should incorporate that. So again, preserving the order, accounting for long term dependencies. And then uh, this design should be able to handle um, different input length, right? So this is also important because let me give you an example. For example, in our feed forward networks, those networks are not able to handle the variable sequences length, right? Because they have fixed input dimensionality. Let's say in our deep neural network, we flattened the data. So this is fixed number of features or even in computer vision convolution, uh, convolutional neural networks. Imagine this is a 256 by 256, right? So the input size is kind of fixed and we have to deal with a model uh, that can handle these variant input length because imagine we are again applying natural language processing as a sequence data we can have different sentences with different length right so this design should be able to incorporate that uh, that need as well and then lastly uh, this architecture better than 
incorporate share parameters across the sequences. This is also a big deal. Remember, when we were doing flattening, when we were doing deep neural networks, for example, deep neural networks, when we flattened all the uh, input layers, we ended up with so many parameters, right? So the idea is that we need to have something like CNN that we can, do you remember we had some filters and we slide that filter through the picture? We want to have, and then we were sharing parameters. Uh, we want to come up with, design an architecture that have that property. We can share parameters across the sequence. So these four are the list of um, requirements that we need for an efficient uh, sequence modeling. Okay, so what is RNN? What is recurrent neural network architecture? And a more important question is that, does this architecture answer the requirements that we just talked about? You know, namely preserving the order, accounting for long-term dependencies, handling variant input length, and sharing parameters, right? So the architecture of RNN is basically inspired by the way biological intelligence process information. And we know that it does it incrementally while maintaining an internal model of what is being processed. So as you're listening to what I'm saying, basically you're keeping track of the information incrementally. You're, you're listening these words, word by word, and at the end of the day, you can put it together and then make sense out of it, right? But at the same time, you are having this, you're maintaining this internal model in your brain to process the information. So this is exactly our, how RNN is doing the job. This ability to remember previous inputs and then incorporate these inputs into the current outputs will allow RNNs to model sequential data. So the idea is that, okay, let's say, so for example, this is a very schematic, simple schematic version of the RNN. The idea is that we have some inputs and we have the output, but output, but the idea is, you know, in each, we're gonna call this recurrent uh, cells, we'll, we'll see what is inside this cell. But uh, it is very simple. We are going to say from each cell, we are going to get a feedback to itself for the next output, right? So we're going to unroll this sequence later on and see what's going on inside. But you can think of RNN basically the, as a model that maintains a state. So this is the term that we use. It, it, it keeps in a state that contains information relative to what it has seen so far, what it has seen before. Okay, so uh, in our world, you can think of RNN as a neural networks with an internal loop, right? So at each step, at each time steps, we are keeping we are keeping a state that contains information from the previous state, and we are feeding it to the output of the next step, right? So as I said, we are going to unroll this loop later on, and we will see exactly what's happening inside. But just remember, this allows the RNN to process sequence of varying length and learn from temporal dependencies. So we have already checked two of the characteristics that we, need, that we needed for sequence modeling design. So first of all, RNN can handle varying length inputs, and of course, it, it preserves the ordering. So, so far, two of those requirements are checked. We're gonna see if RNN can handle, uh, can account for long-term dependencies later on. The short answer is no, so that's why we have to go beyond RNN. And the second one was, is RNN able to share parameters across the sequence? The answer is yes. All right, let's see what is inside this RNN the architecture. So we can start by con you know, contrasting the concepts of perceptron versus a recurrent cell, right? So remember, if you remember from our deep neural network uh, lectures, this is what we call a neuron, a unit, a perceptron, okay? And we have our ordinary input layers. We're gonna pass it to this node or perceptron, which has two mathematical operations, the summation and applying an activation function to incorporate nonlinearities. And then we're gonna pass it to the output layer and make prediction, right? So for example, we have one output, this is our regression and that's it, right? Then we're gonna say that, okay, let's go ahead and rotate this thing. Now the inputs are at the bottom and we have output at the top. And now we're going to add this flow of information from each time step going forward, right? So for example, I'm going to keep track of the previous time step and then add it to the output of the next layer, right? So this is the concept of recurrent uh, cell. So we have the same stuff here. We have this two mathematical operation inside this recurrent cell. We have the summation and activation. So everything is pretty much the same. The only difference is that we are adding this loop here, which is going to incorporate, you know, uh, basically passing information from previous states to the current state. 
Now let's unroll this recurrent cell, right? So remember, these are the time steps. So for example, this is time step t is equal to zero. We have input, we have this uh, cell, which is doing a summation and activation, pass it to the output. We, have, we can generate an output in time step zero. If you want to look at time step one, so this is t is equal to one, we have again another input, another, you know, basically summation and activation, and then we're going to have another output, right? So these things are going to be, this summation activation, we're going to use the same weights, right? Whatever weight here we use, we're going to use exact same weight here. We're going to talk about all these details later on. And then we can do this for, you know, at, let's say t is equal to t, you know, this is our, let's say t is equal to capital T last, last time period, right? The same stuff, the same story. So, so far, nothing special here. We're just simply looking at independent neural network, but we know that time series, it is time dependent. So we have to somehow connect these uh, basically cells at different time steps. And this is how we're going to do that. We're going to connect these things using this, let's say, blue line. And these simply, these curved lines are internal memory. These are the state. Basically, you're passing the previous output information to the next time step, right? To the next time step, actually. And then we can, so in order to show it more concisely, we can just add this loop and then call this thing our recurrent cell right so just be aware these are the differences between recurrent cell versus our simple neuron at uh, the input shape is different and there is this loop so in a uh, let me actually write it down here maybe we have something like this imagine this is our simple neuron this is the input so let's say this is your x this is your prediction right and this is a neuron. Remember, previously it was a tensor of size two, rank two, not size, sorry, tensor of rank two. We had, let's say, batch size 256 and number of features. Let's say number of features were 14, right? And the output, again, if it is a regression, it was 256, rank, basically a tensor rank one, right? Here we have one extra dimension, right? The extra dimension is we have your batch size, your basically the samples, you have your time step, so this is a new thing, time step t, and we have the feature, let's say, again, we have 14 features, for example, the output is pretty much the same, you know, let's say 256, this is the batch size, and it's a rank one. So, if I want to highlight the differences, is this is number one, we have this uh, loop thing, which is passing information from previous states to the next one, number two, the, the the rank right the input rank so tensorflow rank here is two rank two here is rank three and this is an input shape which is different between the two cells all right now we can go ahead and stack a bunch of these cells and call it a recurrent layer so this is exactly what we're going to do here remember in dense layer now um, deep neural network that we defined we stacked a bunch of these neurons and we can have multiple layers as well and then call it a deep neural network. Now we're going to rotate these things. Input is at the bottom, output is at the top, and then we're going to stack a bunch of these cells, these recurrent cells, and call it recurrent layer. So this is our recurrent. And and if you're if you stack a bunch of these layers on top of each other, we can call it a recurrent neural network. All right, let's look inside this recurrent cell in more details, right? So here's the information flow. We are unrolling that cell at time step t minus one, time step t, and time step t plus one, right? So here's a flow of information. So for example, let's focus on time step t. We have some input. So this is your xt. And then we have some information which is coming from the past state. So we, we can show it with state t. Don't worry about the notation. Uh, some people show it with state t minus 1 or h stands for hidden. So some people show it h t minus 1. This is information coming from previous hidden state, right? And But I'm, I'm adapting to the Francois Cholet's notation in his book, Deep Learning with Python. So this is um, what's coming inside this node. And then we're going to apply the same operation that we did in a deep neural network cell uh, or, or node. We said we are doing that summation and applying the activation, right? So we're going to say, remember, we had this WTX plus B. Now we are keeping track of one more thing, which are, which are the weights of, we're going to show it with you, the weights of your state variable, right? So basically, this is the summation part, the Z part. We're going to apply the, the, the activation part as well, right? So at the end of the day, the output at each time split, uh, time step 
is going to be a function, this is your activation function of the input at that time step and the, the variable at that state. Again, we can show it with ht minus one or st minus one or you name it. All right, so at the end of the day, this everything is summarized in this, let me actually go ahead and erase this, this and this s. What we are bringing from previous time steps, basically. We wanna learn these weights, on top of the basically input weight. So this, this is a new thing, right? And there are a couple of things I want you to pay very good attention. So number one is this. So if you pay attention, we are using exact same weights at each time steps, W and U, W and U. These are exact same thing. So this is, this is a parameter sharing stuff. Just like CNN, that we had a filter sliding it over image. Now here we're going to slide it through time. So we're going to share parameters like this, Ws and U, across different time steps. So that's number one. Number two is this. If you look at this recurrent cell, it's you can see that it solves different input length because we can unroll this cell as many times as we want, right? So for example, you're, you have a sequence with, I don't know, length of 10, you have a sequence of length of 20, it really doesn't matter. So that's, that's basically how short or long is this unrolling thing. So it can incorporate those two things, you know, the sharing parameters, number one, using the same W across time. Number two, uh, basically to handling different input variable length. And finally, one last thing to remember is that, uh, just be aware, inside this recurrent cells, there are two sets of weights, right? So let me use blue. One is the weight, uh, blue color. One is the weight for your input, and the other one is the weight for your state variables, right? And uh, of course, when we wanna pass this to the output layer, we can use a separate set of weights, like, let's say WY, and then that's why sometimes you will see that people are saying that inside the recurrent mm -hmm. cell, there are three sets of weights, you know, for input, state, and output but just be aware this is exactly what's happening inside it okay now we can have we can output actually uh, these uh, y hats at different time steps so for example here i have y hat t minus one here i have y hat t this is my y hat t plus one right so in recurrent neural network there are different architectures sometimes you only need to deal with the last one so for example here in our uh, temperature predictions we don't need to output predictions for every single time steps right you want to make a prediction at the very last step so this is this is one example and sometimes for example in text analysis the, or like language translation you want to output at different time steps right so let's actually look into different architectures of rnn and its applications all right here are different rnn architectures and applications let's start with the uh, Top left, this is our, what we call many to one. We have many inputs, so these are the inputs. And we are simply outputting only the last state, right? So we are simply outputting ST, no capital letter T. And um, so in, so what, what are the examples? For example, for time series, we can think of our weather predictions. We were using 120, remember, we were using 120 hours the past five days to make a prediction for the next 24 hours right so this is basically what we were outputting or in the in terms of the text data we can think of you know, sentiment analysis let's say we are dealing with i don't know movie reviews and then there is a sentence here of course it has a specific you no know, different length and then at the end of the day we want to classify that if it has a positive sentiment or negative sentiment so this is what we call many to one in time series the language, you can think of it as a one step ahead forecast, right? Uh, all right, the next one at the top right is one to many. So as you can guess, there's one input and we're gonna generate the multiple outputs, right? So example for this, a classical example is image captioning. So for example, here we have one input image and then based on that, we are gonna generate a sequence of text, right? So for example, we can say a train's traveling down a track next to a forest. So this is the output. Okay. And as you can see, it's a sequence data. So this is our one to many. The next one is many to many. So we have two different types of many to many. The one at the left, we call it aligned. So this is aligned many to many. And the one at the right, we call it not aligned, right? So let's, let's see what do we have. In many to many aligned, the one on the left, basically the input sequence and the output sequence have the same length 
and each input corresponds to a specific output, right? So for example, here length is three, here's length is three, right? And each specific input is corresponding to an output. And of course, we're gonna pass information from the first input to the second and to the third and et cetera, right? So an example for this, you can think of, for example, music generation, right? And the input is a music sheet, the output is the next node in the music sheet, right? Or you can think of another example for machine translation. So machine translation can be either thought of as a line or not a line, depending on how restrictive you want to uh, treat that one, right? So for example, I can do, I don't know, you're doing this, you want to translate from English to French, and your input is I am happy, right? And then you can translate it uh, word by word and say, you go from this one to je suis content, right? So basically this, as you can see, the input size, let, let's say length is three, the output is three, but we know that in machine translation, does not that's not necessarily the case, depending on what language you're transferring from and to each other. And then we can, we wanna be more flexible, right? So another uh, way to handle those kind of things is to use the many-to-many -many not aligned, uh, uh, not uh, aligned version. So basically you have an input, that input is going to be processed and it's going to generate an output sequence at the same time, right? So in the in forecasting language for structured data, you can think of this one as multiple step ahead forecasting, multi-output forecasting, right? So we can have a time series, I don't know, let's say time series from t is equal to one to Imagine this is a stock price, 30 days, and you want to make a prediction for the next five days at the same time, five days right now, right? So this is this is at the end of the month, and you want to make a prediction for the next five days, not sequentially, all at the same time, multi-output, right? All right, so these are different RNN architectures and basically applications. All right, now let's look into more details of the RNN. So this is gonna get a little more technical, so don't worry about it if you're not following. As long as you understand these things at a high level, you're in good shape. So let's answer this important question. How does RNN learn these representation, these things that are shared through time, right? So the answer is backpropagation. There's nothing new here. Our backpropagation is what we used before. You know, it's taking derivative with respect to the parameters and shift them in the opposite direction of the gradient. So that's backpropagation in a nutshell. Here, the only difference is that we're doing it through time. So this means that, imagine this J is your total loss function. We're doing ron j, ron p, and p, these are parameters. And we have different sets of parameters here, right? So for example, we have, this is the weight for input. We have u, the weight for states. We can have weight for output as well. We have three sets of parameters here. Here, just for the sake of argument, let's talk about the only the input weights, and we are going to show it with w, right? And um, uh, let's see what we have. So imagine at each time step, so here's time step is equal to zero and etc. At each time steps, the network is outputting an output, right? So let's say this is the y hat in time step zero. And then we can go ahead and compare this one with the actual y, and then come up with a loss function. Okay, so this is our J0, loss function at step zero. We have J1, we have J2, and up to J3, uh, JT, right? We can aggregate them simply by adding them. So this is what we're doing, simply adding these uh, loss function, call it total loss, right? Now I have a total loss, which is a summation of all these Js at different time steps. I'm gonna go ahead and take derivative or take gradient of this total loss with respect to, let's say only the input weights, right? Again, be aware there are three sets of weights here, but just for the sake of argument, let me just show it uh, with respect to the input weight. So that's gonna be ron j with respect to ron w, right? So it's gonna be the summation of all these and gradients, right? The gradient of j0 with respect to w, gradient of j1 with respect to w, and etc. okay? So, and now we have to pay attention that this cost function is a function of what, right? Let me use another color, maybe red. Remember, this cost function is a function of y, this y is a function of s, this s is a function of activation, this activation is a function of basically your uh, weights, and we're going to take the derivative with respect to weights, right? So this, this chain rule that we have seen before is going to, uh, we can apply it ex in the exact same way. So, for example, we can say ron j, uh, ron j0 by ron w is ron j0 by ron y, ron y by ron s0, ron s0 by ron w, right? So that's it. This is our first derivative, okay? And of course, this s0 is coming from the previous state, s0. Okay. 
Now, we can go to the next time step. Let's calculate the Ron J1 with respect to W. So here, we are here. We want to say, okay, it's a function. Ron J1 is a function of Y1. So we are going down. And then this one is a function of S1. We are going down here. Remember, S1 is the input from the previous one, right? And then S1 itself is a function of W, right? But you might wonder, okay, wait a second. So S1 is a function of W, but S1 is a function of S0 as well. So let me actually use yellow highlighter. Look at this S1. This S1 has input S0 as well, like S2. Look at S2. S2 has input from S1, has input from S0. So these are all in, related with each other. So if I want to write down the equation for round S1 with respect to W, I get something like this. Let me use my pen. Okay, I get something like this, right? Uh, so round S1 by round W is equal to round S1 by round S0. And round S0 with respect to round SW, right? So this means that at each time step, so for example, we are at time step t, this gradient is going to become something like this, which is multiplication of bunch of gradients, right? So uh, let me give you an example. For example, we want to see what is the gradient at time step 3 with respect to weights, okay? So it's going to be something like this, you know, round j3, round y3, multiply round y3, Ron S3, but the thing is that Ron S3 itself is a function of S2, S1, and S0. So we have Ron S3, Ron S2, Ron S2, Ron S1, Ron S1, Ron S0, and then finally this Ron S0, Ron W, right? So this is this is the part we have that we have in this summation, okay? So the idea is that because we are carrying information from using this S state variable, our gradient is going to depend, no matter where you are in the time series, in the time steps, that gradient depends on the from S0 to that time, to that ST. So as you can guess, this is, become, is going to become problematic if your you know, time steps are long. We have to multiply a bunch of these things into each other actually lots of them, you know, let's say we're only looking at t is equal to 100, right? We're going to multiply lots of these gradients. And what if these gradients are small? So this is a problem. Or what if they are large, right? So we have a, we have a problem it's called vanishing gradient um, problem or exploding gradient problem. And that's that's very, very common in recurrent neural network if the, if the input sequence, the, the sequence length is long, right? So we have to deal with that. So let me show you the, this problem of um, uh, vanishing gradients uh, in the next slide and we're going to talk about the details so just one last thing i want to emphasize is that um, guys remember this total cost function that you're calculating here this depends on the architecture right so here our architecture was many to many so we had j um, zero to jt because we had many outputs sometimes you only have one output let's say many to uh, many to one if you have only one output, basically, you have to calculate basically this one, let's say JT, and that's your total. Literally, that's your total loss. So you can go ahead and do Ron JT, so you can Ron W. Uh, the chain rule applies in the same manner, but uh, it, it's going to be uh, involved with less multiplication. Now, uh, again, for the, for the total, for the total loss, right? So total loss here has fewer term compared to total loss here in many to many. Uh, all right. All right, so here is our vanishing gradient problem. So as you can see, as the time horizon gets bigger and bigger, this product, this uh, this gradient that we are multiplying to each other is gonna get longer and longer. So basically we are multiplying a lot of these small numbers. Remember, at the end of the day, if you're using sigmoid or 10H activation function, which by the way, most of the time in an RNN, we're gonna use 10H for, uh, for, for, for activation function, the gradient is always less than one. So if you're multiplying a bunch of these less than one numbers, we're going to get a smaller or smaller gradients down the road. And this error that arises further and further back in the time steps will be harder and harder to propagate into the gradients at the future steps. So this is going to make our parameters more biased, right? So this is a problem. And uh, overall, it's unable So we know that this is structure that we just put together. We call it RNN it's unable to capture long-term dependencies. So here you go. This is one of the caveats of RNN. Because of the problem of vanishing gradient uh, descent problem, 
it's unable to capture very long-term dependencies, right? So then uh, we have to fix this, okay? So again, this, we already talked about this one in the previous slide. Basically, the idea is that no matter where you are in the chain at the time step, when you're calculating the derivative of this state variable with respect to weight, you have to go all the way back to the first state. So basically coming from S0, maybe I should have added this one too. All right. All right, let's wrap up this section by explaining why we should go beyond RNN. So this architecture that we put together, we call it recurrent neural network, has some many good properties, which is designed for handling sequence modeling. But it lacks one important one, which we need to address. So the one, the criteria that RNN can handle, the first one, it's able to preserve the order, right? It was a big deal because we said that if you use deep neural network, we flattening the input layer, the flattening layers is simply going to go ahead and ruin the um, data dependency, order dependency, right? But RNN fixed that one. Then the second thing was RNN could handle different input length. Basically, we can unroll this recurrent cells as many times as we want. So this, this is great. The third thing, you know, RNN was using sharing parameters. Remember, those weight metrics for input and the state variable uh, were shared among the entire time steps and through back propagations were updated uh, uh, simultaneously. So this is very sharing parameters as well. So these are all the good properties of RNN. Uh, however, it is lacking uh, one important one, which is it cannot handle or it cannot address long-term dependencies. And the reason is that basically it only remembers short-term history. And the reason is that we are passing information from the previous state to the next state only. So what if we could come up with an idea that uh, we can share this information through a separate channel and then pass it through the entire network? And that's exactly what we're going to explore in the next lecture video. Another caveat of the RNN was vanishing gradient problem. So we have to fix these things, right? So we need a new architecture maybe. Uh, again, we like these properties for RNN. So somehow we need to extend it to incorporate these two limitations. And that's the topic for the next video. Until the next one, take care.